All right, guys, we are back for section eight of criminology, and we're going to talk about learning theories and control theories. So here is our uh, funny picture of the day. Soda and cheese curds. Like, you know, sometimes you just really need a snack, right? I guess. Anyway, I thought this was funny. So we got to start talking with, if we're going to talk about learning theories, we have to first talk about how people learn. Okay, so this is a little bit of a kind of an intro to psychology course here, right? Um, one of the main kind of ideas in learning is called classical conditioning. Stimulus, response, right? Um, one of the famous people who was uh, kind of involved in this area of research is a guy named Pavlov, right? Pavlov, uh, I'm sure we've heard the, the famous story of how, um, you know, Pavlov had these dogs um, and he would give them food and ring a bell, right? Or, or do some kind of other stimulus. Uh, you know, the stimulus is the bell. The response is they get food, right? Um, so the, basically what he found was after he had done this for a while, the dogs learned to associate the ringing bell and food. And then at that point, if he rang the bell, the dogs would, would salivate and they would expect food because in their mind, ringing bell means food, right? Um, so that's, he's, he taught the dogs to associate uh, the sound uh, with food. But there's also what's called operant conditioning, which is a lot more complicated than just stimulus response, right? So in operant conditioning, there are rewards and punishments, okay? And each one of those can be either positive or negative. And a lot of students get stuck here thinking of positive as good and negative as bad. And that's not what they, those words mean in this instance. Okay. When we're talking about reinforcements and punishments, positive means introducing something or giving something and negative means taking it away. Right. So a reinforcement or a reward, a positive reinforcement means positive giving something as a reward. So if your child, um, you know, gets all A's on their report card, you give them some money, right? That would be a positive, giving them something, reward. Negative reward would be taking away something, right? That's what the negative means, taking away something as a reward. So your child gets all A's on their report card, you take away their chores for the week, right? Oh, the, you don't have to mow the lawn this week. I'll do that as a reward for you getting all A's, right? Same thing with punishments, a positive punishment, giving somebody something or introducing something as a punishment could be something like spanking, right? You spank uh, someone that is a positive introducing, giving them something as a punishment. Negative punishment would be taking something away, right? So my child gets caught staying out too late at night. I take away their cell phone. That would be a negative punishment, right? So please, please, please remember that when we're talking about positive and negative here, we don't mean good and bad, right? Um, we mean giving or taking away. Operant conditioning, so the research on this has shown that you can teach either people or animals or whatever you know we're talking about. Um, these work to change behavior, but re rewards or reinforcements are four times more powerful than punishments. So if you want to change behavior in humans, dogs, mice, whatever you're trying to train, whatever you're trying to uh, teach, you should use rewards four times more often than you use punishments, right? So instead of punishing your child for getting bad grades, you need to reward your child for getting good grades, things like that, okay? So, how does this have to deal with crime? Well, we come to this guy named Sutherland, 1930s. Um, one of the kind of assumptions of all the learning theories is that, or most learning theories, I should say, is that people aren't inherently good or evil. Remember, way back in section one, we talked about how different theories had different assumptions about human nature. Some theories assume that people are inherently good and something has to happen to drive them towards crime. Other theories assume people were inherently evil and had to have something prevent most of us from acting on that criminal impulse. Sutherland 
uh, and, and other learning theorists kind of said, no, neither one. People are a blank slate. People, this tabula rasa, blank slate, right? There's no inherent good or evil in humanity. But we learn how to behave from those we spend time with. So when we're very young, um, obviously the people that we spend most of our time with are going to be our family, right? Parents, um, siblings, maybe cousins. Um, but as we get into our teenage years, we start spending more and more and more time with peer groups rather than family and teachers and uh, religious leaders and things like that, um, which are the people we had spent time most of our time with before that. So as we grow up, as we age, as we get into those prime criminal years, we're spending more and more and more time with peers instead of relatives and authority figures. All of those people that we're spending time with, according to Sutherland, are teaching us. Whether it's, you know, 99% of the time, it's not obvious. I'm not talking about, like, a teacher in, in a classroom at school. I'm talking about um, just every time when you're around your parents and your parents do something, anything. It can be, you know, complaining about the check at a restaurant or, or um, watching television at night or, you know, all these things teach us kind of what's what's normal, what's expected, what the how the world works, right? And Sutherland called these definitions, right? So um, in in my family, um, I learned uh, very young uh, that the family eats dinner at the dinner table um, at I can't remember at some exact time every weeknight, right? And then on the weekends we could eat dinner in the living room while watching TV. That was what I learned from my parents at a very young age. Other people learned vastly different things about what's kind of normal or expected um, behavior um, for people, right? Now, hopefully parents are giving us these kind of anti-crime definitions. They're, they're teaching us um, either overtly or covertly, consciously or subconsciously, that crime is bad, you shouldn't commit crime, um, we need to uh, uh, obey the law, don't steal things, you need to pay for things that you want at the store, you shouldn't shoplift, things like that. But our peers, when we start spending time with our peers, we can get vastly different definitions. We can learn vastly different things from them. If your peers are all smoking marijuana, you're gonna get this definition that smoking marijuana when you're 15 years old or whatever is normal. And thus, if your peers are doing it, you should be doing it too, right? Or shoplifting. If your peers are shoplifting from stores, you're gonna kind of think, oh, well, I should do that too. I'm learning from them. Again, even though it's not, in the vast majority of cases, an overt conscious act, right? It can be an overt conscious act though, right? Because Sutherland pointed out that criminals have to learn the techniques of crime um, and also the, kind of the moral choice to do it, the, the expectation, the, the um, internalization of that worldview, right? So if my peers are going to shoplift, they might consciously teach me that like, hey, if you take this certain kind of candy bar and and uh, slip it in your pocket while the clerk is distracted, you can get away with it much easier, right? That would be a, a conscious, overt teaching act. But they are also, at the same time, covertly and subconsciously teaching me that stealing candy bars is kind of a normal, expected thing to do, right? So that was Sutherland, his idea of learning and definitions, and, and we become criminals because we kind of learn not only the techniques of crime, but also kind of the, the, the moral values and the, the worldview that crime is a thing that we can and should do from those we spend time with, right? Now, differential identification is essentially a very similar theory uh, that came after Sutherland, but it recognizes that not only are we learning from those around us, not only are we learning from those we spend time with, our family and our, our peer groups and and all the people that we're spending time with, but we can also learn from uh, what are called reference groups, right? People that we look up to, people that we want to try and emulate. And these can be anything from, um, you know, people in the news, 
to uh, celebrities, to sports stars, right? Um, uh, when I was a kid, I, I really, really wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up. So I learned kind of how to behave and how to act and what was good and what was bad by these this reference group, astronauts, that I really looked up to. Other kids really look up to and, and want to emulate, uh, you know, sports stars. So uh, if a sports star gets caught for committing some crime or, or doing drugs or whatever, they're going to learn from that uh, um from that uh, situation and they're going to have those definitions and they're and that's going to change their behavior right or if they look up to god forbid criminals right the, the italian mafia or uh, gangsters or you know any kind of john dillinger if they look up to those people they're more likely to learn to act like they do and and identify with that other group and thus act the same way they do right um, so essentially it's, it's, you know, the, the lesson here is it's not just the people we're spending time with, although those, we learn a lot from them too. It's also, in addition to that, it's people we look up to or groups we look up to groups. We want to be more like groups we want to emulate, right? Now, differential reinforcement, another, uh, another variation on learning theory. Um, and it talks about how we use our free will to try to find some kind of thing that we can do that will give us that good reward, right? We, we're going back to the classical conditioning here, right? Stimulus response, right? And if stimulus is crime and reward is, uh, you know, anything from money to adrenaline to peer respect, right? We learn that stimulus, crime gets us the response money adrenaline peer respect right so it kind of takes us back to rational choice theory which i talked about many many sections ago um and instead of talking about kind of a rational choice to to choose crime or not crime it's a learned response that teaches us to go out and choose through our own free will crime or not crime does that make sense there's, there's kind of a subtle difference there, um, but an important one that puts this theory in with learning theories rather than the, the um, classical school rational choice stuff, okay? So, this guy Ben Dura comes along and he says, look, we don't need classical conditioning. We don't even need operant conditioning. All we need is imitation. We don't have to talk about um, stimulus and response, we can just talk about stimulus, right? He did this really interesting experiment where he took a bunch of little, little kids, right? And um, half of the kids, he sat them down in this room where they could see, you know, the, the big dolls, like the weebles, right? Where you know, they, they kind of stand upright, but you can punch them. They're just big, soft, um, you know, usually air-filled things with a weight at the bottom. So you can, like, punch them and, and hit them and kick them. And they, they hit the floor, but then they bounce back up, right? And you hit them again, and they go down, and then they bounce back up, right? So for half the kids, he had an adult come in the room and just start wailing on this doll and being really violent with the doll, right? And then leave. And the other half of the kids didn't see that adult being violent with the doll right then he let the kids loose and let them play and do whatever they wanted in that room the kids who saw the adult being violent with the doll were much 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 more likely to be violent with the doll so there was no reward there was no response there was no um gain of of anything through you know that kind of classical or operant conditioning process it was only seeing it happen it's only that imitation of what they saw right um so learning doesn't necessarily need rewards or punishments or any of that stuff um all it needs is kind of viewing if that makes sense right anyway uh, i'm going to stop this here uh and we'll be back for the second half of this uh section
in just a moment.